Hey folks, welcome to a new episode of Extreme Reloading. In this episode, we're going to talk about statistics for ballistics. Now, nearly every reloader probably has at their disposal a chronograph. And as we know, the chronograph is going to give you a measured velocity, muzzle velocity, uh, of that bullet and the muzzle velocity of each bullet that you're firing. And a lot of folks look very, very closely at those muzzle velocities, and when you're working up a load, they can really tell us an awful lot about what's going on with that load. That's a great thing to look at. But another benefit of having those chronographs is that nearly all chronographs, every chronograph that I'm aware of at least, will also give you a summary. Now, th this summary provides descriptive statistics. And some of those important descriptive statistics are going to describe things like the mean and the standard deviation. Now, those two can be very, very useful for us to really understand what our ammunition, what our rounds are doing today, as well as what they will do in the future. So the first thing that we're going to look at is the mean. And if we draw our attention here to this bell-shaped curve, we're going to see that the mean is given right here. And it is, it is represented by the peak of this bell-shaped curve. The standard deviation is a measure of what we call central tendency. And all the rounds that we fire for this given ammunition will vary about this mean. Estimating how much the second round and the third round and the 100th round, how much that will vary from the mean or the average muzzle velocity, is where standard deviation comes in very, very handy. So if we take the standard deviation and we subtract it from the mean and we add it to the mean, that will estimate this spread right over here. So we're taking the mean plus or minus one standard deviation. And that estimate gives us a confidence of 68.2%. In other words, if we're firing 100 rounds through that rifle, the same exact load, same bullet, same case, etc., et that we can expect 68% of those rounds, or 68 of those rounds if we're firing 100, to have a muzzle velocity somewhere in this green area right over here. Now 68% may not give us enough confidence. However, if we apply two standard deviations or really statistically 1.96 standard deviations, then we have a confidence uh, that increases to 95%. In other words, 95% confidence interval that all of our rounds, or 95% of those rounds, will have a muzzle velocity somewhere in this area. To achieve 99% or darn near 100% confidence, we have to apply three standard deviations to either side of this mean. Now, the reason why most folks do not apply three standard deviations is because when you're doing this, the spread becomes so large that the data almost becomes useless because it has such a huge spread. And when you're getting into the tails, these things here, we're seeing very, very few rounds with these extreme low velocities and high velocities. So normally, we focus on two standard deviations, 95% confidence. Now if we draw our attention over here, we're going to simulate 
that we have a rifle, a round, with an average muzzle velocity of 2,600 feet per second and a standard deviation of 10 feet per second. With 95% confidence, we see that the rounds are going to vary by almost 20 feet per second. That's this area right over here. Now before we go down and look at this region of the table here, let me talk just a little bit more about standard deviation and sample size. Our 95% confidence assumes that we have a sufficient sample to base that reliability on, to, be, to base that confidence interval on. If we're simply firing three rounds over the chronograph, oh, we'll get a mean, we'll get a standard deviation. Um, but how representative of that entire population is that going to be? Well, not so well, not so good. Uh, now, when you hear the word population, that indicates essentially all the rounds you're ever going to fire with that rifle, with that exact same brass, exact same powder charge, pull it, uh, so on and so forth. Of course, we don't want to fire all of our rounds over a chronograph. That becomes kind of cumbersome, difficult, and even unnecessary. So we like to sample it. Well, what's a large enough sample size? Three, probably not. Five, maybe, but probably not again. Ten rounds, that's getting better. Twenty rounds, thirty rounds. Now, thirty is kind of the magic number in statistics for minimum sample size. Practically speaking, though, firing 30 rounds in a given session may have some other ramifications or byproducts that we're not so interested in. In other words, after we exceed maybe 7, 8, 9, 10 rounds, we're going to start heating that barrel, heating that chamber, and we'll likely see the effect of that heating in the muzzle velocities themselves. So what might be the smartest way to establish a good sample for your load is to fire maybe five, six, or seven rounds over the chronograph in a given session at a given ambient temperature. Let's say it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Go out again on another day when it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit or allow your rifle to cool adequately and ensure that it's still 70 degrees Fahrenheit outside and then shoot another five, six, seven rounds over the chronograph. And then a third time and so on until you get about 30 rounds as your sample. At this point, we can feel pretty confident that we have sampled sufficiently and that our mean and standard deviation are meaningful. So now let's look over here. If we take this same average, 2600 feet per second, and apply to it the standard deviation right here, we're essentially going to subtract 20 feet per second and add 20 feet per second to this average. That gives us the range of velocities of about 40 feet per second across, again, this region right here. And we have 95% confidence that the next round and the next round and the next round are most likely going to have a muzzle velocity somewhere inside this range. Now, if we're shooting 100-yard targets and we have doped uh, our, our calculations, our trajectory calculations well, we're going to be adjusting 31 MOA, a come up of 31 MOA. Of course, people are going to adjust based on the mean. So you're going to adjust by 31 MOA. That translates into a drop of 324 inches, or we have to come up 324 inches. But if we're firing enough rounds, we could legitimately see that some of those rounds are going to drop 32 MOA, while others will drop only 30 MOA. 
indeed a full 2 MOA variability across this same range. In inches, that translates from a drop of 335 inches to a drop of 314 inches or 21 inches. Now if you're shooting F class and uh, you get out to a thousand yards and you know that your ammunition is going to vary all by itself, the ammunition is going to vary by 21 inches or it can vary by that 21 inches, it may not be such a good thing. So what I like to see, whenever I'm working up a load, I really strive to get my standard deviations down to single digits. Sometimes that's really, really difficult to do, but crafting that ammo to be as consistent as possible, I think you're going to be able to do it. And in most cases, I've always been able to do it, especially in uh, my kind of my precision rifles that I use. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Extreme Reloading.